Studying history will sometimes make you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Studying history will sometimes make you feel deeply upset. Studying history will sometimes make you feel extremely angry. If studying history always makes you feel proud and happy, you probably aren't studying <laughs> it. <laughs> so if you go to the next slide, so let's begin. Now I'm going to talk about the problems in the Middle East. Drought, earthquakes, and if you don't remember, almost a year ago, uh, there was a massive earthquake in Turkey. Countries overly dependent on rain, bad leadership, low yeah. bureaucracy, displaced peoples, refugees fleeing fear, military conflicts, invasions. Those are the problems in the Middle East. Now, of course, I'm describing the late That's Bronze it. Age collapse. And I want you to think how the problems then resonate with today. And of course, Given that this is a Sunday and this is the church audience, of course, you have to realize this is also the history that serves as the backdrop to the Bible, particularly to the New Testament, uh, Old Testament. Uh, particularly, now I want you to think if this place sounds familiar. So if I talk about all these problems and the late Bronze Age collapse as a backdrop to the Bible, there's a place here on the map called Gaza. Yeah. And I want you to understand how, if it was strategic then, you could understand that regardless of who are the players covering it, it would be strategic now. Well, some of the players you do know, because around this time, you see these people in the desert known as the Hebrews are making their way over to it. And if you look at these places here, Ashkelon, Ashdod, and notice how close Megiddo is. And I want you to pay attention to what is this place, Megiddo. Here's Gaza. Uh, for all intents and purposes, if I gave you the geography today, imagine a drag to San Diego to Los Angeles without traffic. Okay, that's the key. You have to imagine it without traffic. From Gaza to Megiddo, the distance from San Diego to Los Angeles. This gives you an idea of the geographical breadth. But I want you also to just notice the geography of Megiddo and the Gaza back then. A group of people known as the Sea People. Uh, this was the backdrop uh, to the geopolitics back then. We go to the next slide. Now, again, if I were just to show you the relevance of history, if you see this uh, rockets being launched, uh, projectiles being intercepted. Again, you might think this is recent, but what if I told you this picture was actually taken? Or the same geography, Tel Aviv, but it's 1991. This is, in fact, the Gulf War, and a good number of you might have remembered the scud missiles that were raining upon cities like Tel Aviv, the various anti-aircraft defenses. This isn't the first time, you see, whether it's the late Bronze Age collapse or 1991, you see how history informs our current crisis. This is the only argument I'm going to make. This isn't about right or wrong. This is about you can't understand what's going on without a historical background. Next slide. I begin now with a scarce resource, water. Now, you might say, what does this uh, Sumerian seal have to do with water? I want you to look at the symbol of the crescent moon that was very much related to fertility and the delivery of water, where it was a moon god known as Sin in ancient Sumer, in, who dedicated the great ziggurat of Ur, Okay, Ur is a place, I'll show you where it is in the next slide. It's also the birthplace of somebody who's going to be very important in today's lecture. Very important for people who are fighting right now. Abraham is supposed to come from Ur. The religion, what was some of the religions practiced during Abraham's time? Well, it would have been polytheistic reverence for moon gods. So much so that when the Sumerians revered the moon as a god, they, they dedicated a whole day to it. It's the day many of us might be regretting tomorrow, moon day. You abbreviate it as Monday. Of course, that is <laughs> just the legacy that we owe to the Sumerians. The Sumerians worship seven gods as seven planets, celestial gods, that is. Of course, they worship the sun, hence there was a Sunday. Okay. Uh, well, of course, we use the old pagan symbol that the Nordic Vikings borrowed from the Sumerians. If you want to look at a long chain, and of course, if you're familiar with one of the other days, well, of course, there's Mars Day. As it's 
Spanish, Martel or Martedi in Italian. Uh, there is Bowden's Day, Wednesday, okay, or in Spanish, Miercoles, Mercoledi, Mercury Day. There's Thor's Day or Jupiter Day, Friday or Venus Day, Saturn Day. We all get this from Sumer. It's the people who settled before. In fact, this is the religion Abraham was trying to overture, a polytheistic worship of multiple gods, but we still see this pagan tradition, not only in the days of the Weekends. Now, of course, when the world became, uh, um, of course, what did Christians do to make the calendar somewhat holy was they changed two days. Okay, so it's no longer Saturn Day, but the day of the Sabbath, Sabado or Saturday. And then, of course, Sunday in the Latin languages is the Lord, the day of the Lord, Domenica Domingo. Okay, so those two were changed. If you go to the next slide, I just want you to realize that whenever you see the depiction of the Virgin Mary, the Virgin Mary always stands on a symbol of fertility, the crescent moon. And this is actually a pagan borrowing. They borrowed it from the Sumerians. So that when you're trying to get pagan peoples who worship the goddess of fertility, in the shape of a crescent moon, you basically tell them you are always worshiping the Virgin Mary all along. Not only was it used to convert pagans, so little known fact, what is the symbol of Islam? It's the star and crescent. Yes. The star and crescent is actually the Muslims borrowing the Christian symbol of the Virgin Mary because they too venerate the Virgin Mary. So that's just a little known factoid. Uh, you go to the next slide. Yeah, you'll see always the Virgin Mary's on the star, on a crescent, and it's a symbol of the ancient Sumerians, it's a symbol of the Muslims, and it is, in fact, a Christian symbol. Next slide. So going back to Abraham's place, birthplace, Ur, and if you see, Ur was facing the sea in those days. Ur was facing the sea. The geography of Iraq is right here now. You have to think of descriptions of the flood and where would the flood might have happened. Well, definitely there was a lot of flooding back and forth here. Because it, now, because I'll show you the geography of this place goes all the way here. So there's Ur, okay, the birthplace of Abraham. And Ur, remember, this is the Sumerian civilization. I just showed you some archaeology from when Abraham would have come from Ur. If you go to the next slide. Now, if I fast forward, and this is the geography of Iraq today. These are an area known as the marshes. And there's a place here called El Kurna, which claims to be the birthplace, not sorry, the birthplace. I, I'm not sure if Adam was born. The creation <laughs> place of Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, is claimed here. So, I mean, what better place on a Sunday to begin, to begin with this geography, the book of Genesis, its relationship to water going back and forth. Now, keep in mind what happened to this biblical Edenic site was it was deliberately drained by Saddam Hussein. Because after the 1991 Gulf War, a good number of the army deserters fled to the marshes to launch a rebellion. So the land was deliberately drained by Saddam. Eden was drained by Saddam. Uh, next slide, please. Now, if you ask them this question, why Iraq's biblical paradise is becoming a salty wasteland? Well, you have the answer. Now, I, I just described to you, I set up the biblical uh, place. Why did Abraham leave Ur? Probably a couple of things. Probably a, a calling from God, but also probably if we use water as a background to the history of the region, perhaps we could call him a climate migrant as well. That's pure speculation on my part, but let me just show you how much climate dictates the history of the region. Nevertheless, why is Iraq's biblical paradise becoming a salty wasteland? It's number one, Saddam's legacy. After he was overthrown, the uh, various canals that diverted the water were undone. The water was allowed to come back to the marshes, but never to the pre-draining levels under Saddam. And so what you had was a combination of dry riverbeds, and then, next slide, please. The following. So if you look at Ur, this is supposed to be uh, basically in function of the tree of knowledge, the marsh region, what is the merge. Remember, the book of Genesis gives a geographical description. The Garden of Eden was located at the confluence of four rivers. Two of those rivers survived. Two of the other rivers are now dry riverbeds or wadis. Wadi in Arabic, of course, entered the Spanish language as Wad, 
as in Guadalupe, Guadalajara, all the wadis uh, in Spanish come from Arabic. Okay. So here is the biblical weight, uh, the biblical marshal. Okay. Now, why is it becoming a salty wasteland? Next slide, please. Huh. Rising temperatures and the decrease of water coming from the head, the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates. Now that's the land associated with Noah. And where the ark was settled, think the mountains. Where the ark might have settled is also where the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates originate, and a series of dams being constructed there. Okay, so now I'm giving you a story of the Middle East through water. Yeah. Who is facing the end of Eden? Climate change comes to the cradle of civilization. You see, I'm not the only one who likes alliteration. <laughs> Next slide, please. You'll be surprised in your vlog. There is a community that reveres John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. They said, this is a community. Their origins are unknown. We, can, we think these might be the Samaritans, who again might have fled due to climate conditions that this way went from the Jordan to the rivers of the Tigris and Euphrates, which were probably running at a much, if you are a follower of John the Baptist, of course, what is key to your faith? Running water. So the followers of John the Baptist, here are you seeing them at the Tigris and Euphrates, right? The Samaritans are barely a few hundred in the Holy Land surviving today. It's believed, and this is their story. We are descendants of the Samaritans. They are followed their, they are a follower of John the Baptist. They're called the Mandaeans or the Sabians. If water is key, if you go to the next slide, baptismal rites, okay. So whether you baptize yourself with holy water or Muslims baptize themselves five times a day because they're play, here is an entire faith devoted to the running water. Next slide. You see it here. Next slide. What will happen to this community if the Tigris and Euphrates one dry? Water will be a lot more scarce. And their plates of worship will disappear. Uh, so much so, a good number of them actually do live in San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> Next slide. You do have followers of John the Baptist living in San Diego. So if I go big now, I might say the story of war. And here, look how I'm just saying, telling the story of two rivers uh, that come together right around here. This is today's Baghdad, and then they fan out to what is today's Syria and Turkey. That's the year 4000. Now, if I go to the next slide. I'm going to tell you a tale of two shepherds from the year 4000. I jumped to the year 2014. <laughs> and I'm showing you the same map, except along the two rivers, a new entity emerged called the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Now, what if I told you the story of the Iraq, of ISIS, as it was called, through the story of rivers? Its capital, Araka, is on the Euphrates River. Now, right around the emergence of ISIS that happened in 2014, given around 2008. Let's go back to the problem of droughts. I told you about droughts earlier. Droughts were man-made in, in the case of Syria. Uh, the poor use of aquifers led to the displacement of a good number of Syrian shepherds and farmers. Uh, Syria tried to become self-sufficient in the cultivation of cotton. It's very water-intensive. They depleted the aquifers. And what you had was a good gen a, a generation of shepherds and farmers displaced from the agricultural lands and pouring into the urban centers, such as Raqqa, displaced from the land. Think the Great Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. And if there was a group calling itself the Christian state of Oklahoma and Kansas, offering their redemption, don't you think a lot of people would have signed up, particularly if they were paying? That's the story of Isaac. A good number of its recruits were displaced farmers due to the droughts that were occurring here. Now, when ISIS emerged, it simply conquered down the two rivers. It's very much a story. ISIS should really be called the Islamic State of the Euphrates and Tigris. He right? said. <laughs> anyway, now, I want you to go downstream. What was happening here? Well, the other legacy of Saddam Hussein, the draining of the marshes, rising temperatures, the decrease oh, no. of water upstream, led to a good number of displaced Shia Iraqis from the marshes. Mm -hmm. Now, who did they join? They joined, not the Iraqi army, that collapsed in 2014. 
It's crazy. It's almost been 10 years, but if you remember those events, they joined the Shia militias that mobilized to defend the country from ISIS. So what you had was two sets of militias, ISIS and the Shia militias fighting each other. But theoretically, you could have had displaced farmers from the marshes and displaced farmers from the upper Euphrates fighting each other, one in the name of the Islamic State, the other in the name of the Iraqi Shia militias, but both a story of displaced farmers at the end of the day, displaced shepherds. What happened to those Shia militias? In 2014, they mobilized. Ten years later, the U.S. is bombing them as we speak. Ten years later, these militias at Rose were able to, who would you go think from displaced farmers to using drones that depend on satellite technology to reach a U.S. military facility in Jordan? The U.S. retaliates. And of course, that entire crisis was contingent upon the events that happened after October 7th. Next slide. And so here I tell you the story of Syria, and you notice how I'm working my way down the river. This goes to show you where the displacement was happening in Syria. Combine a lot of drought in Syria with wildfires burning up what? Due to increased temperatures. We have droughts in Syria. Think of the Temple of Solomon was built by cedars from where? Lebanon. What if I told you all those cedars, for the most part, were, are being burnt in forest fires? And again, the forest fires, what is causing them? Unusual weather patterns in the Mediterranean. So here I can tell you stories of forest fires in Lebanon leading to protests against the Lebanese government in 2019. Displaced farmers joining ISIS. That would also could be one of the factors that contributes to the Syrian civil war. Next slide. Oh. So what if I show you a journal part of that? Climate change in the Syrian civil war, the Jazeera's agrarian crisis. The Jazeera is just that upper Euphrates and Tigris area that I referred to, where Abraham would have reached in his lifetime. Well, compare this article in a journal, academic journal, to the following article. Next slide. Climate droughts warn famines in Galilee as a background for understanding the historical Jesus. Okay. Do you see the story I'm telling you? Notice how I'm going back in time. How climate is so much, very much an important element in the story of climate. And you have to realize when Jesus was in his lifetime, he was emerging during an insurrection or the eve of an insurrection. Okay. It's uh, by 40 years after his death, you have basically a civil war in Jerusalem. And this is the question, how much of the Jewish revolt was also connected to depleting water resources? This is a question, it's again, conjecture. Next slide, please. So now we just zoom out. And I guess we just went through a kind of whirlwind tour of the first house. <clears throat> now if I just show you the geography, this is Gaza. And you see what Gaza is. There's the Sinai. This is where the Ten Commandments were uh, uh, delivered. And now you get a story of why Gaza is so important. Gaza is not the connection between the Middle East and Egypt. It's the connection between your Asia and Africa. That's the last stop before you're finally reaching the continent of Africa. Next slide. So now, if we go back in time, remember when I said keep your mind for Megiddo? There's Megiddo, and notice how it's just a few kilometers away from Jerusalem. And of course, for those of you who don't know it, Megiddo, well, uh, you all know of Megiddo thanks to another St. John. Now, I talked about St. John the Baptist, but now I'm talking about St. John of Patmos, or St. John the Divine, who describes Megiddo having an important role and what he thought would have happened in his lifetime, St. John the Divine, or St. John the Patmos, in his series of revelations, argues that a final battle will occur in Harvey between the followers of Christ and the followers of the Roman Empire. And why would there be a final battle between the Roman Empire and the followers of Christ at Harvey Where well, it's very simple. It's a military base. Harvey is in a nice flat plain. Jerusalem is not a good place to build a military base. First of all, the Jews living there would abhor a Roman military base there. And from a military standpoint, 
you might as well control the approach to Jerusalem in the nice flat plain. Har Megiddo is the name of the Roman military base. Mm. And of course, Har Megiddo over time was rendered into Armageddon. Armageddon. Armageddon is not an event, it's a place. That's where the final showdown would occur for the followers of Christ to liberate the Holy Land from Roman occupation. Hence the term of Diego. If there was a new religion that emerged in San Diego, calling for the liberation from the U.S. Army, it, its event might be Camp Pendleton as its final showdown. You see, that's what is Camp Pendleton, just simply the largest marine base in the San Diego area. That's all Megiddo was. Now, the other thing that needs to occur for the final battle is St. John the Divine would have been being, he was living in Patmos today, Greek island. He would have been writing in Greek. Revelation was written in Greek. He also talked about the lifting of a veil. Now, to lift, basically he was saying, finally the people will lift the veils over their eyes to finally see that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, keep in mind, who is he probably addressing? Gentile Romans and Jews who had yet to lift the veils over their eyes to realize Jesus is the Messiah, not a Messiah. And of course, in Greek, anything to do without, without a veil, removing starts with an A. Think anorexia, anaerobic, apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Apocalypse literally means lifting the veil and realizing. So two words that enter our end of times. Uh, vocabulary, apocalypse, Armageddon. Do you see how much is very much related to the geography here? Patmos, not too far, just right here. Next slide, please. Now, I want you to realize again over time, think of the Persians, the Achaemenids that freed the Jews from their captivities, think King Darius. When King Darius of the Persian Empire freed the Jews from the Babylonian captivity, right? That empire would later go on to conquer Egypt. Through what? Through Gaza. There's Gaza again. Next slide. And again, if, yeah, this shows you the Persian Empire at its height. And if you've noticed even back then, Gaza was the link between Africa and the Eurasian heartland. Next slide. And then finally, I want you to look at Alexander. Alexander conquered Egypt. Later, there was no Alexandria before Alexander had to conquer Gaza. And there in Gaza, he was wounded. If he died from his wounds in Gaza, he wouldn't be Alexander the Great. He would be Alexander the Nobody. The Alexander the Who? <laughs> Alexander not only got wounded, he was quite addicted to this great pain reliever. Today we know them as opiates. And back then, yes, Alexander recovered from his many wounds through the use of opiates. He is able to conquer Gaza, and goes on to conquer all of Egypt, creating Alexandria, creating one of the greatest cities in Christian history. So much so that it's not a surprise that a Saint Mark would die there and be buried there. Saint Mark, the person who gives us the same day of Saint Mark on April 25th, the same day when Spanish conquistadors landed in the valley not too far from there. And what do conquistadors do when they land in a new place and give it good luck? They name it for the same day on which they arrive. Yeah. When did the conquistadors arrive in San Marcos? The <laughs> land of St. Mark, April 20th. <laughs> the St. Mark who would die in Alexandria. First, Alexander has to create in Alexandria, which he does. And it began through Gaza. Now, if you go to the next slide, I want you now, now our story comes full circle. I began here with Ur. This is a Greek map of the Middle East. I begin with war, and now we work our way, and there's Gaza. And this was the Greek Middle East, the Greco Middle East. And of course, their area. And you see, see how water is really a system of waterways that dictates by taking away the national boundary. You see how why the term the Perkoff Crescent was invented to refer to this area. Next slide. And then finally, you know, I get to the Roman Empire. And now Jerusalem has been conquered because it's about the year uh, 1480. Okay. Uh, the timeline, the end of uh, Caesar Augustus's uh, rule, the Roman Empire has been declared. And even for the project of empire, Gaza is key. Gaza is the Roman road to all of North Africa. Next slide. Now, 
I showed you the water, the aquifers that fed the rivers. There's the Dead Sea. Here's the Jordan River. I put no political boundary. Do you see where most of this land's rivers are? Now, what if I told you that most of this land here, the West Bank, remember, it's the West Bank of what? The Jordan River. So what if I tell you that water is really key to understanding the conflict today? Next slide, please. Now then, look at this slide. Water crisis may make Gaza Strip a new capital by 2020, reckoning in the year 2019. Mm -hmm. And I want you to think when people are thirsty, when people don't have enough reliable water, that feeds grievances. Mm -hmm. And go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And what better organization that feeds on grievances <laughs> than a group like this that calls itself the they resist the movement of resi Islamic resistance in Arabic, abbreviated as Hamas. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the next slide, now when I say what group feeds off grievances, remember Hamas is ruling the Gaza Strip. When Gazans don't have reliable water, they will blame the Israelis. But on some levels, they will also blame. The group that's running that territory, Hamas itself. So, what if I told you right before October 7th, there was a movement of Gazans <clears throat> protesting Hamas's inability to deliver reliable services? And just think, if we don't have electricity and water for three days, we would all be out on the streets as well. <laughs> now, what if I said then to imagine October 7th as a way of diverting attention from their own failures? And delivering reliable services. Okay. Now, go to the next slide. I want you now to think of something else that's unusual. Something that, again, you would might be able to relate to. And it's this. Suicide in Islam, like Christianity, is a sin. Only God has the power to take away your life. So how did we get to the case of the use of suicide bombing in the Middle East. It's a very recent phenomenon. I'll tell you, it's a very recent phenomenon. If I look through all of the Islamic history, in the case of Sunni Muslims, or I can give you the events, for Shia Muslims, Sunni Muslims, the Shia Muslims only adopted tactics in 1980, Sunnis in 1996. A suicide bomber is a cyborg. Now, what do I mean by cyborg? It's literally a cybernetic organism. What is a cyborg? In theory, I'm a cyborg right now. I am marrying inorganic technology to amplify my voice. A pacemaker makes you a cyborg. When we go scuba diving, technically we have an artificial lung. The term cyborg was invented when humans first went into space and needed all these artificial contraptions to survive in the vacuum of outer space. During COVID-19, when intubation was needed for the ventilators, the ventilators basically was the sick person becoming a cyborg. The suicide bomber is a cyborg. When they marry the explosives to their body, they become a living cyborg. Now, but that's what happened, right? That's a modern technology. So why do I say then in Islamic history there couldn't have been suicide bombers? You went into battle not knowing if you lived or died. Even if the odds were against you, you put your will in God's hand, right? That's what they throw out most Islamic history. When you have a suicide belt draft around you, you're committing suicide. And you know it. So the justification had to be invented. That strapping an explosive vest around you was not an act of suicide, but an act of martyrdom, just like going into the battle when the odds are against you. It was a weapon of the desperate. Technically, the first terrorist cyborg was not invented by Muslims. It was by a predominantly Hindu group in Sri Lanka, known as the Tiger, uh, Tamil Tigers of uh, in, uh, Sri Lanka. They were the first to use the human body as a living weapon. 
Next slide. Now, you see the evolution. And now bringing women into this history. In the 1970s, the iconic Palestinian woman okay, was somebody who hijacked planes but did not want to kill herself. <laughs> now, this is not only a woman, this is a mother who is committing suicide, who is going to turn her body into a human body. And she's doing this on behalf of Hamas. Next slide. <laughs> Now, look what this person in the Middle East is doing on Twitter. This was a suicidal mother, right? But do you see how she's comparing herself to this woman here? Okay. In other words, and also, we have to remember what I keep on saying. The situation is dire. And our circumstances, look at the rhetorical questions I keep on asking. Would we, I say we as a society, succumb to the same in this particular case. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So what is this film, Paradise Now? And I highly recommend it. If you want to understand how we got to this current concept, Paradise Now is the film I highly recommend because it was produced before October 7th. But it's so relevant to understand how we got to the current crisis. Next slide. So this is the terrorist fight work. Hamas in 1996 was the first group amongst Arab Sunnis to use suicide bombing as a weapon. And they were the first to overcome that theological prohibition against suicide, that cardinal sin of committing suicide, was rethought by arguing this is not suicide anymore, it's an act of martyrdom. Next slide. <laughs> Why are you not told? Uh, this guy is causing, yeah. maybe he has a computer virus. <laughs> there we go. I want you to see how extracting your best to your body. And I want you to think of this. This was just choreographed suicide. These were flying cyborgs. Instead of the vest, they turned the whole entire plane into their suicide vest. But think about this. In 2001, the world was changed when 19 people committed suicide and took along all the passengers with them. And see how that act of suicide changed the world. But you see now the story I'm telling you, how what began in this land that's being fought for. In 1996, Hamas was the first group among Sunni Muslims to use suicide as a weapon. This is now the weaponization of suicide. This is where it got Al Qaeda followed later. Al Qaeda followed that tactic only after that theological problem was overcome. A problem that is also shared with Christianity. Suicide is a sin. Next lecture. And next slide, please. Uh, um, so now I want you to think of this article. Let me see. This person also likes. Alliteration. <laughs> Disappointed, dischanted, defiant. Inside of the world's West Bank. Inside the world of the West Bank's angry farm view. The article came out after October 7th, but I want you to now kind of interrogate what does suicide mean in terms of temporality? In other words, these people who kill themselves will be doing it in the name of martyrdom. But I would argue whether you're committing suicide in the name of the cause or even suicide on a daily basis usually has to occur because in somebody's life, both past and present offers no prospects for the future. That past comes together in your present where you decide there's so much trauma that happens to me in the past okay, that I can't imagine a future. And so then I'm going to now think that without the ability to imagine a future, my future might as well be better in an afterlife. Mm -hmm. Now, for the case in uh, the West Bay or in the Hamas, I want you to think everyone who's killed himself or herself, you know, there has to have been enough mm -hmm. events in the past to create enough trauma in the present where this person says, I am going to take the decision to take my life. And along with others, 
because I can't imagine a future for myself. If I set it up as that, then I want you to think of all these people being described in the West Bank. Now, remember, this is not Gaza. But what do I, what do I think? If you're disappointed, this chant is defiant. That is what creates the category that creates trauma, where you don't see a future, where with the inability then to see a future, suicide becomes helpful. And I want you to think on October 7th, a good number of people who conducted those attacks probably were thinking this is a one-way trip, that I'm going against a much stronger enemy. This is an act of suicide. I think they were taken by surprise how much damage they were able to inflict. But we forget a good number of the uh, Hamas uh, attackers were killed. They, they, when they went, these were one-way journeys. They were going to breach the barrier. They weren't going to come back. Next slide. So that our journey, we just stopped on the waters of the Holy Land. Let's keep on going. I want you to look at this person here. His name is Cecil Rhodes. Uh, he was a diamond trader. A whole country was named after him called Rhodesia. There's a scholarship at Oxford endowed in his name that a one Bill Clinton studied in Oxford under him called the Rhodes Scholarship. Rhodes had a vision of extracting diamonds in South Africa, but also linked to a railway that would link South Africa all the way to Egypt under British control. I want you to look at Cecil Rhodes' book. It is from Cape Town to Cairo. Another example of trans liberation. One foot is in the Suez Canal. The other foot, not really there, but you need it to be open, is the uh, entrance to the Red Sea. And then we go to our next level of water process. Uh, right here, in Arabia, Felix Arabia, Arabia Felix, the land of Queen Sheba, the one who visited David. What can we say about this particular land? Uh, go to the next slide. Well, this is it. This is Yemen. And I want you to think of societies like this. How much, these are the societies of the Wadi that depend on the flash floods. This is southern Yemen. That's like, you can see here how these societies are quite precarious. If you don't have the flash flood, that's a matter of life and death. And that's life. And so these societies in the south of Yemen, it's not, it's, uh, you know, they can only su support so much population. <clears throat> and when you don't have reliable water, a lot of times the population has to migrate. Uh, in this particular area in southern Yemen, a family did migrate to what is today Saudi Arabia. Uh, the family that came from the south of Yemen, you might have heard of it, is the Bin Laden. The Bin Laden family came from a Wadi river base and eventually migrated to Saudi Arabia. Next slide. Now, this guy is not chewing matcha. <laughs> this is a narcotic called pot. Uh, it's a mild stimulant uh, and it's very water intensive. Next slide. So, this is written in 2014. Why is Yemen so violent? because it is so poor and thirsty. And in that violence, a group known as the Houthis emerged. Next slide. Now, I want you to look at these coffee bags, Yemen mocha, al mocha, the world's first coffee. This is where we get coffee from. It came from Yemen. Next slide. This is the port, and the port is named Makha. You pronounce it as mocha. It has nothing to do with combining coffee and chocolate. That's a crime against our culture. <laughs> mocha, like Armageddon, is a place in the Middle East. Next slide. And if you see, it's very close to the Red Sea and it's opening to the Indian Ocean. Mocha is not only a good place to ship coffee, it's also a good place to attack shipping. And you have to understand that what was now a place to sell coffee is now a place to launch cruise missiles at international shipping. Now, coffee was a great thing to grow. Why didn't the Yemeni stick with it? It's because the coffee plant was stolen from Yemen. 
and when it was planted in new places such as Colombia and Brazil, the Yemenis couldn't compete. And you have to realize all the coffee, why is it called Cafe Arabica? Mm -hmm. Is all the coffee grown there, nor could it compete when the Dutch got a hand on their own plant and grew it in an island in Indonesia known as Java. Okay. The Yemenis couldn't compete. What did they go to instead? The cultivation of cotton. That mild stimulant that they couldn't really export. They consumed it domestically and it depleted most of Yemen. Next slide. So you can see this is the world shifting. I think the next slide is better. And you can see the Suez Canal in the area of the Houthi attacks. In the 1950s, the British and French attacked the Suez Canal because there was a disruption of shipping in the 1950s. Here we are in 2024, replace the French with the Americans. And here we are now still fighting over these narrow chill points. The geography is still so important. And so now this is the interesting thing. When we think of the Houthis, there they are chewing their butt. We look at them like this, right? Always kind of being depicted as these kind of rabble uh, tribesmen brandishing their Kalashnikov. Next slide. This is usually how we see the Houthis. Next slide. Now, what are the two actors that engaged in the first instance of space combat? I ask you in an exam. Is it Hamas <laughs> and Israel? The Houthis and Israel? The Houthis and the Blowers? <laughs> Who would get it? It's the Houthis and Israel. What do I mean by space combat? Next slide. You see, the Houthis inherited ballistic missiles from the primitive government, but Iran also sent them ballistic missiles. By definition, a ballistic missile goes into what we call outer space. The first human-made object that ever entered outer space, that line defined at 60 miles above the Earth, was the V-2 rocket. That was the first time anything human made entered what we call space. The V-2 went into space, launched from Holland, and then gravity brought it back on London. The Houthis were able to use ballistic missiles fired from Yemen towards Israel. And how were they intercepted? Uh, the U.S. provided Israel with the technology to create the aero system. Another missile was also launched into space to intercept it. That was the first example of space combat. It happened in October hmm. 2023. Houthis were launching missiles in solidarity with the other age, Hamas. The first thing. So, in other words, we go to the next slide. What I imagine every time I hear Houthis. Now, if you know, if you recognize this, it's not a stretch to think of these are characters from Star Wars, but the Houthis <laughs> and Israel were the first characters ever and to engage in what we would call the Star Wars. Next slide. So I'm going to conclude and allow time for questions, but I highly recommend this article for another reason. From Ukraine to Lebanon, a tale of two Maria. So everyone, take your phones out and watch it. It's about my Lebanese Christian side of the family, hmm. but also a tragic anniversary is approaching, the second year anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine. While I was visiting Maria, this is my great aunt in Lebanon, another Maria was escaping for her life in Ukraine on the same day. And I give you the story of the crescent, the name Maria. Next slide. And just to kind of now realize, when I said there was another four-letter word I wanted to talk about, that four-letter word is what happened when your life is upended, when the security as we know it, and there's a word for this, ontological security is upended. Why is this image so striking? I watched the day Ukraine was invaded and I was watching it from Lebanon. This is mother and child, a refugee, if you will, while her husband had to go fight on the front line. She was escaping to the border with Poland. And I'll go to the next slide. While I was watching that, this is in the, grand, the living room of my uh, Lebanese Christian side of the family. And what did I see there while I was watching that image <laughs> of mother and child? Mary and her child. Next slide. 
And it's ironic that when I went to the internet to find something that was similar to her image, I found this random. Mm -hmm. But do you see almost the resemblance is uncanny. Did this real life, I don't know what her name is, but this real life. And remember, these two at one time were refugees. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And then now I show you an image that's tragic like this. To just kind of give you resonance for what's going on. Next slide. Right, good job. And the two of these seem to fit this season. And again, uh, this is another member of the family. He's Palestinian Christian. And where does he come from? He, he, this member of my family comes from Bethlehem. And if you, I mean, if you again remember, this is now our story coming full circle. Probably descended of one of literally the oldest Christian families on earth. Next slide. So yes, I conclude with images like this that speak volumes, where I don't need to speak on his behalf. Next slide. Okay. Sorry, that was it. That was another one. That's another lecture and another tragic, but our journey stops it. I end with this. So thank you for this very long whirlwind journey that began thousands of years ago over time and space. I leave it now. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Sorry, were you from Lebanon? My, so my family side, uh, one side is from Iraq, mm -hmm. and then the other side that's from Lebanon, I had to find them later in life. And that, that's what I described in that article, how I found them. So my side of family, they're Iraqi Muslims, and I had a Lebanese Christian side that I had to discover. Now, I mean, if I told you my family's background, it, it seems like a contradiction. They are Iraqi <laughs> and Iranian, for those of you who remember the Iran Iraq War, they are Christian and Muslim. Now, you might see all of those categories as contradictions, uh, but I would argue that's actually it's quite banal for these kind of warring sides to result in mixed families. I would say that is actually most of the history of the region. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably reminded me to mention that. Any questions? Yes. So you use the word trauma. And that's been built up for hundreds of years. Uh, how do you re how do you reverse that? Um, because someone's carrying the trauma, and I've heard that uh, somehow it's genetically passed mm -hmm. because it's so horrendous. It's like mm -hmm. Disney for me. You think the first we'll get out of what we're in. Really good question. And because of course now you're referring to one of my favorite books that's called "The Body Keeps the Score." Yeah. And that is the, where the, that scientist makes the argument that PTSD gets embedded into the DNA. And this is what I fear. Now, if I, I just told you a lot about the past, now I'm projecting into the future. Uh, we're having now traumas on both sides. And that embedded trauma does not bode well for future peace mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And I don't have the answer for that. I can't imagine the future based on the scenario you just gave. But that trauma literally gets embedded, it gets uh, transferred. The generation. Sorry, I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad you did it because it reminds me if I could recommend a book. It's that book mm -hmm. that is really key, which has nothing, I mean, it was published well before this conflict, but it will explain a lot of this because when the bullets fight, that's when the real conflict becomes the recovery, when the bullets stop that. Yes. I can think of several examples around the world where. The natural resources, water, and your, what you just talked about, or something else, oil, the Caspian Sea and all the countries around that, or the Aral Sea, mm -hmm. which is the water, and then all the cotton fields around that. And it was Pakistan, exactly. Pakistan, yeah. Iran, Turkey. You know, there's just so many wars over those kinds of things. So, I mean, this is one horrible example of it, but there are many others too. Well, the, the, it's good you mentioned the RLC because I think what the Soviet Union did and the Syrian government did in terms of, there's this great book called Seeing Like a Stage, where it says basically authoritarian states, when they manage these great projects mm -hmm. with good intentions, mm -hmm. usually have disastrous results. So that's also very good. A uh, question, and I also have a very good book to uh, recommend called Seeing Like a State, uh, written by a political scientist at Yale named Scott. 
who writes about that? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, very good question. And now we're witnessing the results. Mm -hmm. Very good. Just wanted to ask if there are parallels to. I believe we had a speaker before, and she discussed how there was some war profiteering in which the, the we were paying the Taliban, and, and we were giving them the money to, uh, no, I'm sorry, the Taliban was paying us, and we were giving them missiles. And uh, we were still in the Taliban, but we were still giving them missiles. And I just want to ask if there were any parallels to that, to, to like how the violence continues in Gaza and Israel. Are we, are we still, are we still participating in this sort of Perpetuating the war uh, uh, in along the along the same lines as we did in other areas. Well, I mean, let me also connect it to a two-year conflict that began with Ukraine, and I, I think in both cases we could say, uh, yeah, there have been a lot of companies that profited. I mean, whether I showed you those, you know, every single one of those missiles. Um, well, let me put it this way: uh, when the fighting with the Houthis began. Right, and this was raised in um, Congress. A cruise missile, a Tomahawk cruise missile, is about two million dollars, right? And usually, you're taking out Houthi targets that are maybe worth, you know, let's say a garage worth at most about fifty thousand dollars, right? And so this Congress person asked, "Yeah, how sustainable in terms of just the costs are this?" But definitely, you know, every weapon being launched is being purchased. So the definitely profiteering profits are being made, whether as of February 24th, 2022, or going to Agna, absolutely, that's an issue. Yeah. Yes? This is very simplistic after all the background you gave, but did I hear you say to some extent the timing maybe of Hamas doing what they did was because of the growing discontent with their leadership? Mm -hmm. It's a couple of, it's not simplistic at all. No, no, it's, but uh, there's probably a confluence. There was that. Mm -hmm. There was the prospects of Saudi Arabia normalizing ties with Israel. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, you know, it seemed to be on the horizon that got derailed as right. a result of this. So it's probably, and it's, you know, for most of these kind of great historical events, there's usually a confluence of factors that come together. Mm -hmm. So that, that was perhaps one, and that was also probably the other. Yeah. Where now it's, you know, it's very hard to even for Saudi Arabia to fathom normalizing ties with Israel. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Um, my question is, how did anybody justify in Hamas's attack in October of uh, the incredible, uh, not only I can't seem to justify a child with uh, a vest on, you know, at all, unless he's totally indoctrinated and he's from birth, and like you said, revenge, revenge against each other. I, I, I just don't understand how Hamas, the, uh, again, the rapist, like, murders the incredible how they were these young men just totally indoctrinated into be all of their life just such hatred of the israelis to do that i mean how could you do that well, uh, uh, let me answer the question if you've been watching you know the news over the hundred days it's not how could they do that my question is Will they want to continue to do that? I mean, if you think about everyone who's now survived the, the bombing of Gaza. So if you think of the two million people in Gaza right. and what they've endured, and then now throw that question in the future, can you imagine anyone who's endured what happened in Gaza since October 7th seeking revenge? Yeah. I think I've answered the question. It is uh, what happened on October 7th happened. But now imagine what has been endured by Gazans after October 7th. What would they want in terms of revenge now? It's well, that's why it keeps going up. The, I mean, it's going to go on. It keeps going on. And then to, then to answer the question about kind of, uh, you know, this being embedded in the DNA. So in other words, trauma is inflicted on both sides. And that's a sad way to end this. Sunday. <laughs> 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 I just want to let you know.